Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Sandra Morgan, and I'm pleased to serve as moderator for this, our final conversation of the academic year, which is a part of our series, Jews Around the World. Today's conversation explores the Jewish communities of Morocco in a program entitled The Sultan's Communists, Moroccan Jews and the Politics of Belonging. Before I make introductions, I'd like to remind you that your microphones are muted, but not your voices. We look forward to excellent conversation and insightful questions, which I will present at the end of the speaker's presentation. As a reminder, to ask a question, please select the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and type it there. You may also join the conversation in the chat section. As always, we ask that your questions be courteous, productive, and on topic. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Chaya Kessler, Director of Jewish Studies here at Kent State University and our program partner, Dr. Jacob Lebenz, the Director of Judaic and Holocaust Studies at Youngstown State University. Chaya? Hi, good evening. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this has been really a pleasure to collaborate with Youngstown State University with the Judaic and Holocaust Studies and bring you different aspects of Jews around the world to different countries. So today we're going to Morocco, which is one of my favorite destinations. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank those of you who are um, joining us, who have joined us. I'm hoping that in the future, next year, hopefully, it depends on if we are doing it face to face, we'll be able to travel again, travel again, together to other des destinations. I want to thank the Youngstown Area Jewish Federation for always supporting us and underwriting this program. Jacob. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome from Youngstown State University as well. Thank you for coming. My thanks to Kent State University and for, to the Jewish Studies program there for their collaboration throughout the semester uh, to help bring you uh, and our communities uh, and our universities, such fantastic programming, and I'm excited for the program that we have arranged for you tonight. So without further ado, allow me to welcome our guest, uh, uh, Dr. Alma Rachel Heckman, and introduce her to you. Dr. Alma Rachel Heckman is the Newfield Levin Chair of Holocaust Studies and Assistant Professor of History and Jewish Studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She specializes in modern Jewish history of North Africa, and the Middle East with interest in citizenship, political transformations, transnationalism, and empire. Her first book is The Sultan's Communists, Moroccan Jews and the Politics of Belonging, published by Stanford University Press in 2021, so this year. Uh, additionally, she is working on a co-edited volume examining Jews in radical politics in a comparative framework. She has held fellowships with Fulbright, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and the Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies at the University of Pennsylvania, and has, pub and has published her work in a number of journals and edited volumes. You are in for a treat tonight, and I look forward to hearing uh, about uh, this lecture. Thank you. All right. Uh, well, thank you all so much for that kind introduction. Thank you to those of you attending in this bizarre Zoom universe that we all inhabit. Um, and thank you to Professor LeBenz for inviting me to give this talk. So I'm going to share my screen. And there you go. You should be able to see that now. Um, so this is the book cover that um, Professor LeBenz just referenced. And I'm going to be talking about this book. And it seems like a fairly obscure topic or a very, very specific topic, right? The Sultan's Communists. Moroccan Jews and the politics of belonging. And usually um, when I introduce this topic to people, there are several elements that are unfamiliar. The fact that there were communists in a place that has a sultan and that Jews would have anything to do with either of those two things. And by the end of this lecture, I wanna show you how deeply intertwined all of the elements of this title really are and how it isn't that surprising um, when it comes down to it. And it's a little known aspect until now of Moroccan Jewish history, but one that really does tell the story of Moroccan Jewish history in the 20th century, even through a minority of a minority lens. 
So before getting into the meat of the book itself, I want to talk a little bit about how I became interested in this topic in the first place. Right after I graduated from college, I had a fairly, um, I had the good fortune of receiving a Fulbright grant to go to Morocco with a very poorly defined project. Um, mm -hmm. It was just to sort of document Jewish sites all around Morocco. And I spent a lot of my time in cemeteries. I spent a lot of my time in synagogues. There still is a very small Moroccan Jewish population in Morocco, but it's very much reduced from its height of about 250,000 people just after the Second World War. And so I was really thinking about what I was doing as documenting um, the past, as documenting cultural sites, cult sites of cultural heritage. And as part of that project, I volunteered at a museum that you see the, the front of that museum pictured on the left hand side of the screen, the Moroccan Jewish Heritage Foundation and Museum. And I spent a lot of time in their archives document um, creating a catalog essentially for all of these papers that um, Jewish communities from around Morocco had deposited in these archives that had not been opened yet to researchers that had not been well cataloged yet. And the director of this foundation and museum is the man you see featured on the right hand side. His name is Simone Levy and he happened to be one of the leading Jewish members of the Moroccan Communist Party starting in the late 1940s when he really began his own activism. And he was critical in the party's movement toward the national liberation of Morocco. Morocco was colonized by France in 1912, um, French and Spanish protectorates starting in 1912 and it became independent in 1956. And Simone Levy, along with a coterie of other Jews were really involved in the national liberation politics of Morocco from colonial rule. And they did this through the Moroccan Communist Party. And I had never heard of such a thing before I got there and before I met Simon Levy. And I began to wonder how exceptional of a figure somebody like Simon Levy really was. Um, how many other Jews were there that were like him and what did it all mean for Moroccan Jewish history? I had, I had heard about Jews leaving en masse for Israel in the 1950s and 1960s, but I had not heard about those Jews who wanted to remain in Morocco and those who did so by participating in nationalist politics. So this book, is the result of 10 years of inquiry sparked by conversations and interviews I did with Simone Levy. Archival research took me between Morocco, France, Israel, the United States, the United Kingdom, and I worked in French, Arabic, Hebrew, Spanish, and English language documents. In addition to more formal archival bases, things like diplomatic archives and state archives, I also made use of personal archives, including the personal archives of Simone Levy himself, um, which really further enriched the project and gave me access to a lot of political ephemera that I might otherwise not have had access to. And it really, a lot of the archival and oral historical research I did for this book was dependent on the generosity of so many in Morocco and around the world. This is the first book to examine Jewish participation in Morocco's anti-colonial movement and the problems of political and social belonging Jews faced, not only during colonial rule, but after as well. Today, I wanna to walk you through the main narrative arc of the book, as well as its main arguments and interventions. And I look forward very much to your questions. Overall, the Sultan's Communists presents the untold story of Jewish radicals involvement in Morocco's national liberation project. The chapters extend from the beginning of leftist movements and demographic upheavals in the 1920s through the high point of Jewish political activism in the immediate post-World War II period to Morocco's repressive post-independence political history in the 1970s concluding with a discussion of the 1990s and the Moroccan state's lionization of its Jewish past. This scope 
encompassing both the colonial and the Cold War contexts, brings into view the connections between the demographic and ideological shifts within both Morocco's Jewish population and Moroccanized communism, as well as the power of the Moroccan state. As such, this book is simultaneously a history of Moroccan Jewish communists and more broadly, a history of Morocco and its Jews in the 20th century. This book is about a minority within a minority, Jews in the Moroccan Communist Party and how they became the most famous of Moroccan Jews. In short, this is a story of how a small group of people gained prominence both within Morocco and internationally in ways that conferred benefits on all parties involved. Unearthing this story sheds light on the very mechanics of colonialism and anti-colonial agitation, the history of Zionism in the Middle East and North Africa, the MENA region and its detractors, and the formation of a modern nation state out of a colonial legacy and the Jewish role within that process. Finally, studying Moroccan Jewish communists demonstrates the possibility of Jewish patriotism in the Middle East and North Africa, long after independence and regional wars with Israel that contributed to the massive Jewish exodus from so much of the region including Morocco during the 1960s and 70s. The story of Morocco's Jewish communists is both emblematic and exceptional of the history of Jews in Morocco and of the history of Moroccan political life across the years of colonial occupation into independence and the Cold War. The legitimacy of the Mahzen, which is an Arabic term for the centralized Moroccan state, the legitimacy of the Mahzen of Jews as Moroccans and of the Moroccan Communist Party as quote unquote authentic to the values of Moroccanness, all came to support and serve one another. While bolstering their mutual legitimacy, the Mahzen and the Jewish communists also proved each other's Moroccan authenticity. As the book's chapters demonstrate, a triangulation of historical contingencies and necessities ultimately enabled both Jewish communists and the Mahzen to combat a legacy of colonial sectarian politics through one another. Each aimed to restore, according to the nationalist narrative, the pre-colonial and pre-Zionist patriotic harmony between Muslims and Jews loyal subjects of the Sultan who became a king, the commander of the faithful and the protector of his possessive Jews. The book's narrative follows the lives of five prominent Moroccan Jewish communists, Leon René Sultan, Edmond Amran El Malé, Abraham Serfati, Simon Levy, who I started by talking about, and Sion Asidon, and they'll be popping up throughout the lecture as I continue. And I'll return to those figures in a little bit. One of the book's central arguments has to do with a, free, with a few pre-colonial paradigms governing Jewish life in Morocco and the way in which those paradigms became challenged and ultimately resurrected by both communist Jews and the Moroccan state in the run-up to independence from colonial rule and after. The first one of these paradigms is called Dhimmi status. Dhimmi refers to, it literally translates to protected in Arabic, and it relates to the status of Christians, Jews, and Zoroastrians in the earliest years of Muslim rule throughout the Middle East and North Africa, the protection of the so-called Ahl al-Kitab, or people of the book. Um, so this related to different legal status, but fundamentally the protection, the guarantee of certain rights for particularly Jews and Christians, the other monotheistic faiths under Muslim rule in exchange for certain taxes, clothing restrictions, building height restrictions, and other kinds of restrictions that depended on the regime and power and time and place. So that idea of protection is what's really critical to take away here, that old um, Islamic legal category of protection of Jews 
The second one is convivencia, which is Spanish um, for living together, basically a kind of harmonious living together. And that references um, the, the status of Jews and Christians under Muslim rule in Spain, in medieval Spain. And this idea, this sort of oftentimes overly romanticized idea that Jewish and Christian and Muslims all got along together perfectly well under medieval uh, Muslim rule in the Iberian Peninsula. And uh, Morocco claims to have inherited that convivencia legacy from medieval Spain after 1492, when the Jews of Spain were expelled. And then the final paradigm is that of the Sultan's Jew. And this comes from the scholar Daniel Schrader. He wrote a book called The Sultan's Jew, and it's no accident that my book is called The Sultan's Communists, and Daniel Schrader knows about this title. He's a good mentor and friend of mine, so he's okay with me appropriating his title in this fashion, um, but he was writing about Jews that functioned as go-betweens in the early 19th century, late 18th century between the Moroccan Sultan and different European states abroad, notably um, Britain at the time that he was writing, and that Jews functioned as representatives of Morocco abroad and representative of Morocco's state interests. And that is another dynamic, another paradigm that I argue comes to be the case for the Sultan's communists, for these communists that come to serve the Sultan and the state interests, despite having served as opposition figures in different moments of their political history. So colonial rule, French and Spanish protectorates that began in 1912 and would last until 1956, would fundamentally disrupt these pre-existing paradigms that I just went over. And here is a dramatic photo that features in the introduction of the book. So I like to, um, it's a very symbolically rich um, it says a view of two rooms in the Sultan's menagerie that are one of which is occupied by lions, the other one is occupied by Jews. And this refers to a moment in 1912 when the French Protectorate Treaty was initially signed. Um, Moroccan guards, Muslims, um, began to um, riot against the French and they went through the Jewish quarter, um, began to demolish Jewish properties. Um, and attack Jews on the streets there, which led to a French military bombardment of the Jewish quarter and led to Jews seeking shelter in the Sultan's palace. So again, that proprietary relationship we see start right at the beginning of colonial rule. And the lion, I should mention, is the symbol of the Moroccan monarchy itself and of the Moroccan state. So you have this deeply symbolic photograph of the Moroccan state as a lion behind bars and the Jews adjacent to it, while colonial rule and the tensions surrounding colonial rule are at the gates, quite literally. Um, but there is a reason why Jews became popularly identified with French colonial rule and why Muslim soldiers attacked the Jewish quarter in the wake of the French protectorate treaty signed. These disruptions of pre-existing paradigms followed after institutions like the Alliance Israelite Universelle, which already had begun to act as a wedge between Jews and Muslims, between Jews and Muslims in Morocco. And I'll explain this organization in a minute. This is part of what I reference in the book's title, The Politics of Belonging. How did Moroccan Jews belong to the Moroccan nation? And how did that relationship change over time? And there is this really a sense of proprietary relationship between the Sultan whose title became king after independence and his Jews pre and post colonial rule. Contestations over the politics of belonging were at the heart of imperialist incursions in Morocco well before the establishment of the French protectorate in 1912. French power, of course, had been growing in Morocco and in North Africa more broadly since the beginning of the 19th century. French Jewish politics and the colonial mission civilisatrice or civilizing mission 
also extended into Morocco in the work of the Alliance Israelite Universelle long before the formalization of a protectorate treaty in 1912. The Alliance Israelite Universelle encouraged the formation of new Jewish subjectivities and inevitably politicized identities. The Alliance itself was a French Jewish philanthropic educational network founded in 1860 to help Jews of the Middle East and North Africa, as well as European Ottoman lands, quote, regenerate. And regeneration was one byword for the mission civilisatrice, that so-called civilizing mission, based on the prevailing European orientalist and colonial logic that the peoples of Muslim majority lands had somehow, quote, stalled or regressed in their development while Europe had advanced. The purported goal of the mission civilisatrice was to regenerate the subject of the Middle East and North Africa into an évolué or a quote evolved subject, at least according to French standards. The Alliance established its first school in the northern Moroccan city of Tetouan in 1862. And by 1895, the Alliance boasted 70 schools and nearly 17,000 students from Morocco to Iran. But regeneration also meant a deracination in the process of becoming évolués, in speaking and thinking in French, in becoming entrenched in French history and geography with a sprinkling of Jewish studies, students became divorced from their home languages and home customs. Alliance pupils often found themselves, in the words of Albert Memmi, à cheval sur deux civilisations, straddling two worlds, unable to be fully of the home community of their non-Alliance educated parents or their Muslim neighbors, nor accepted as fully French or European. In a cruel twist of irony, the very organization that was motivated by the zeal of citizenship and emancipation in France made it much more difficult for Jews of the Middle East and North Africa to be ultimately embraced as local or authentic citizens as movements for national independence developed. Fundamentally, French colonial policy and institutions redefined and challenged Jews' relationships to Muslims in the Maghreb, North Africa, which would be significant in developing nationalist platforms and models of patriotic citizenship. This problem of authenticity, Moroccanness, belonging, and legitimacy would come to inform the figures I explore in this book and their political motivations against the background of massive upheaval. Under colonial rule, many individuals, including colonial officers, Muslims, and Jews themselves, saw Moroccan Jews as complicit with colonization. And that's in part as a result of organizations like the Alliance that I just discussed. And because of French relative access to French language education, a disproportionate access of Jews to the French political hierarchy relative to Muslims. And of course, there was also a rising tide of anti-Semitism between the two world wars in Morocco itself. And it's during that time period that we see the growth of communist politics in Morocco as well. European communists arrived, began to arrive in the early 20th century for infrastructural opportunities to work on the port of Casablanca. You see a sort of early version of the port here. Um, to work on the port of Casablanca, to work on growing railroad lines, growing factories, all of these sorts of growing industrial initiatives that came along with the beginning of colonial rule. And Simone Levy's eventual wife was actually one of the people that came along to as part of this migration of European leftists. Um, Simone Levy's wife, whose name was uh, originally Encarnacion Rogel, she was born in Casablanca, but she came from um, Protestant Spanish immigrants to Morocco. Um, they had already been converted from Catholicism to Protestantism by a wandering missionary in the Iberian Peninsula. And the family story went that um, the family who was deeply poor 
was trying to go to the Americas for work, but they misheard the names of the boats being called at the dock and wound up on the wrong boat and ended up on a relatively short trip to Algeria instead of a relatively long trip to the Americas. Um, and once they arrived in Algeria, they began working on French imperial uh, infrastructural developments like ports, like railroads. And through those working connections made their way to the port of Casablanca where Encarnacion Levy's mother, uh, well before she was Encarnacion Levy, before she met Simone Levy, Encarnacion's mother, um, who was an ardent socialist, plied um, horse meat. She sold so horse meat at the docks of Casablanca, served with a side of socialist propaganda at the same time. Um, and that's just to show, I mean, there were these waves of Spanish, Italian, and French um, laborers that came in already politicized toward socialism, toward communism, and started the early political networks um, of socialist organizations and communist organizations in Morocco, where they often were rubbing shoulders with Muslims and Jews on those infrastructural projects and in canning factories, etc. Jews and Muslims became involved in communist politics for a number of reasons, but for Jews, it was primarily the appeal of the anti-fascist politics of the period and the fact that the Moroccan Communist Party was part of a Moroccan popular front strategy against the rising tide of fascism that was spreading not only in Europe, but also across North Africa and the Middle East. During the interwar period, Moroccan Jews were drawn to a wide array of political affiliations. It was possible to simultaneously be a Zionist, pro-France, as well as a communist. And that's why I picture here the first of my major characters, Léon René Sultan here. He was born in Algeria, in the city of Constantine, Algeria, um, where he became a lawyer and he ultimately made his way to Casablanca where he opened a law practice where it, at the same time is becoming a leading figure in the Moroccan Communist Party. He would become its first non-European secretary general after the Second World War, um, or during the Second World War, I should say, in 1943. Um, he was a prominent member, but he also fielded a team of, Zion, of Zionist Moroccan Jews to go to the Maccabea Games. Um, that were being held in then British Mandate Palestine, and he also advocated for reforming French colonial rule over North Africa, not abolishing it. The Moroccan Communist Party emerged out of the French Communist Party and other leftist groups in Morocco during the interwar period partnered with anti-fascist politics. Anti-fascist activism in response to the Spanish Civil War, as well as the rise of Nazism and its attendant propaganda, spurred Moroccan Jews and Muslims to join leftist organizations. These organizations overlapped with the Communist Party of Morocco, essentially a branch of the French Communist Party. And when France fell to Nazi Germany in the summer of 1940, this became a betrayal of promises of the Alliance Israelite Universelle and the purported universalism of France. The Vichy regime instituted anti-Semitic persecutions, both within France and across North Africa, including limitations of Jews in certain employments, quotas on Jews in certain schools, um, and uh, living restrictions as well, living quarter restrictions where Jews could live. Um, making them leave, in some cases, the European-built new towns of a place like Casablanca and move into the older Jewish quarters. And I argue that this period accelerated pre-existing political conditions and stakes. However, the pre-war period was much more fluid, whereas it was possible to be simultaneously a Zionist, pro-French, and a communist during the pre-war period you had to choose a direction after the Second World War. It was no longer possible to be all of those things simultaneously. And as a result of the predations of the Vichy period and the betrayals of that anti-Semitic legislation, Moroccan Jews were increasingly galvanized to support political alternatives to France, including Zionism and communism. The Moroccan Communist Party was the primary avenue for Moroccan Jewish expressions of patriotism, 
and participation in the national liberation movement. During the Second World War, the Communist Party of Morocco transformed into the Moroccan Communist Party, became a national party, becoming an anti-colonial national liberation party with a Muslim majority leadership and membership, which was a dramatic change. In rejecting French colonial rule, Moroccan Jewish communists identified primarily with Moroccanness. Um, as the concept evolved into a nationalist patriotic identity predicated on a narrative of pre-colonial protection under the Sultan, and with that protection, a legacy of social harmony between Muslims and Jews. That model of social harmony, in turn, drew on romanticized narratives of that paradigm I mentioned earlier of convivencia, of living together, of Jewish life in medieval Muslim Spain mapped onto modern Morocco. Following the Second World War, Moroccan nationalists, including Jews, took advantage of the relative weakness of France, as well as the newly established United Nations to fight for freedom from French and Spanish colonial rule, established in 1912 and soon to end in 1956. The Sultan became an important symbolic then active figure during the war, while the mainstream national liberation organization, Istiklal or independence in Arabic, issued its manifesto for independence. The Moroccan Communist Party followed suit in short order. Every viable political party supported a vision of Moroccanness bound with the institution of the monarchy itself. Jewish involvement in the Moroccan Communist Party grew out of anti-fascism in the interwar period and became a national liberation movement, transferring from a popular front organization into a national liberation organization. One of the reasons why the Moroccan Communist Party appealed to Jews was its universalist expansive definition of Moroccan when most national liberation parties foregrounded in a rabo Muslim Moroccan national identity. While the meaning of Moroccanness evolved over time, for Moroccan Jewish communists, it meant embracing Moroccan cultural and national identity formations to the exclusion of all others. And here's where I have a quote from one of my other characters, Edmond Amran and Male. Um, I unfortunately don't have time to go in depth for all of these different figures and um, their different contributions, but Edmond Amran and Male was another leading Jewish member in the Moroccan Communist Party, and he wrote for the newspaper Espoir, or Hope, a communist newspaper in December 1949, he wrote the following, we are Moroccans, we are not foreigners as the Zionists would have us believe, we are deeply Moroccan. Right, an example of a commitment to that kind of Moroccanness and the embracing of a Moroccan identity to the exclusion of all others. In other words, embracing Moroccanness entailed a commitment to Moroccanize and reject French, Spanish, or Zionist politics as threats to the Moroccan nation and Jews as an integral part of it. It meant a pluralistic Morocco free to develop its full potential and a narrative of pre-colonial Muslim Jewish peaceful coexistence. In fighting for independence through a universalist party that defined Moroccanness broadly, Jews fought to demonstrate their authenticity as Moroccans and their belonging to the Moroccan nation. As a result, they demonstrated the legitimacy of the monarchy as their protector in the figure of the commander of the faithful, the Sultan turned king. While during the late 1950s through the 1990s, prominent Moroccan Jews rejected specific policies of the monarchy and its turn toward authoritarianism, they did not attack the legitimacy of the monarchy itself. They fought for an idealized vision of Morocco, while simultaneously the vast majority of Jews left the country. And so that's Edmond Amran and Male. Here is Simon Levy when he was much younger. Um, he was another leading figure in the party. Um, but there were also major splits in the party that developed in the late 1960s and 70s with different strategies for how to handle a post-independence 
increasingly authoritarian regime. Um, starting in the late 1950s, early 1960s, the Moroccan monarchy began to really move to crush any opposition to a centralized regime. Um, and this meant largely crushing of leftist political parties in addition to the defanging of other political parties, including Istiklal, um, the mainstream National Liberation Party. And so Simon Levy, this is just a copy of his National Library card, but so you can see him a little bit younger. Um, this is a declaration from many of the Jews. If you look at the list of signatories on the right hand side, um, this is a list of many, many uh, prominent Moroccan Jews that were part of leftist political organizations. And here is a petition pushing against national newspapers that conflated Jews with Zionists um, and also critiqued Moroccan Jews for not doing enough to distance themselves from Zionism. Um, but there were different splits on the left and among Jews within the left, as I mentioned. So Simon Levy, I mean, several of these figures that I talk about spent time in prison, were arrested for their political activities in the post-independence regime. And some figures chose to work with the regime to choose to operate in a legal um, and functional status. And that was Simon Levy. So here you see a campaign poster from after the Moroccan Communist Party changed names. For those of you who read Arabic, you'll see it's the party for progress and socialism. It's no longer the Moroccan Communist Party. It resurfaced under a new name. Simon Levy chose to work with the regime with a legal version of the party after it had been banned. Whereas somebody like Abraham Serfati, who was another major um, Moroccan Jewish, he's arguably the most famous Moroccan Jewish leftist figure, Abraham Serfati, um, chose to leave the Moroccan Communist Party, um, objected to it working with the regime, objected to its softening of its political stance, and instead founded his own farther leftist um, organization called Illa Alemem, or Forward. And so you see he, here he is on the um, cover of Young Africa of Jeune Afrique, and it says those who don't play the game, um, basically those who don't mess around, and here's Abraham Serfati. He was a very, very prominent crit critic of the regime and critic of Simon Levy, figures like Simon Levy, who chose to work with the regime in legalized forms of the left. Um, Simon Levy was one strategy. Abraham Serfati embodied another strategy. Abraham Serfati, and this you might know to remember from the news not so long ago, um, Western Sahara, which might not be on everybody's radar that often, Western Sahara um, was a critical part of that split between Simon Levy and Abraham Serfati. Abraham Serfati supported the Polisario Front, the independence activists of Western Sahara and was hauled into prison. He spent ultimately about 18 years in prison for his support for the Polisario Front, while somebody like Simon Levy walked, was one who was very proud of the, himself for being among the first to walk into Western Sahara as part of the Green March, um, claiming the territory for the King of Morocco. So diametrically opposed strategies to that territorial acquisition. So that was the source of a major split. Um, there was a major moment of upheaval and violence in 1961. It was a critical year when Egyptian pan-Arab nationalist President Gamal Abdel Nasser visited Morocco and violence against Jews broke out. The sinking of an illegal Zionist emigration ship and the death of the Sultan Mohammed V elevating Hassan II to the throne who was deeply unpopular relative to Mohammed V. There were also two coup attempts against Hassan II in 1971 and 1972. So all of this created a relatively unstable political environment, um, which made Jews very um, anxious, understandably, within the country for their political futures. And so it's not only what was going on with the 1956 Suez War or the 1967 Six Day War. I mean, those things mattered too for out migration of Moroccan Jews and the conflation of Moroccan Jews with Israeli policy, but also internal political instability 
that caused a lot of Moroccan Jews to leave the country in, in mass numbers. But Abraham Serfati became one of the most famous Moroccan Jews that stayed. And here you see a piece of um, propaganda from a human rights organization, um, an open letter to Abraham Serfati. And it says, in the country where the sun is king, women and men disappear in the shadow of the kingdom. Hassan II, king of Morocco, detains one of the longest serving political prisoners in the world since the liberation of Nelson Mandela. So this is from the early 1990s after Nelson Mandela had been released. Abraham Serfati was still languishing in prison um, because of his support for Western Sahara. And meanwhile, um, meanwhile, Simon Levy was operating as an elected official showing these very divergent trajectories among Jewish members of the left. The last major figure is Sion Asidon, and he, of all of these figures, is the only one remaining alive today. He's the youngest. He was born in 1948. He was also put in prison for his support for the Polisario Front and for his agitation against the king. Um, and he worked with Abraham Serfati um, from within prison walls, um, penning different political tracts and sharing political advocacy ideas. And I just want to share with you some more really wonderfully creative examples of some of this propaganda just because I love them so much. Um, here is from this group called the National Union of Students from Morocco, the section of Toulouse. So this is a group of Moroccan students in France protesting the imprisonment of figures like Abraham Serfati and protesting the political authoritarianism reigning in Morocco. It says, for the liberation of all political prisoners in Morocco. And then it says, in Morocco, there's more than just sunshine and oranges. And you can see there's that wonderful um, drawing of an orange with a hole cut out of it and people embracing prison bars. Um, and you see a sticker on the side. It might be a little hard to read, but it says Maroc. That's how you say Morocco in French. Um, a sort of provenance sticker suggesting that somebody is picking up this orange in a French supermarket and is complicit by buying into the Moroccan export economy, complicit with the imprisonment of these political detainees in Morocco, complicit in their suffering. And on the other side, you see it's a New Year's card from 1979. Uh, it says, best wishes, 1979 says, you know, in Morocco, they're not just sunshine and oranges, they're also political trials. And it lists the number of trials between 56 and 70, 70 and 76. Um, 3,000 have been committed to different sentences before tribunals for their opinions, for politics of opinion. About 150 centuries of collective imprisonment have been distributed to these political prisoners. And Abraham Serfati was one of the most famous internationally among these. And here you can see another really remarkable piece of propaganda from the same student organization. Um, and you can see here is, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but I'm circling Abraham Serfati. Um, he's up one from the bottom, just above Omar Ben Jaloun at the bottom left-hand corner. Um, and you see he's listed with a number of other prominent political opponents, political prisoners, some of whom died in prison. Abraham Serfati was in solitary confinement for a very long period of time um, before being ultimately, and tortured before being ultimately part of the larger prison population. And you know, it says, um, let's break this wall of silence, it says at the bottom, and it shows um, images of prisons, these square grid-like things are prisons in Morocco, and it shows the exchange here of a tourist with a camera and a cowboy hat and shorts coming into Morocco while laborers are going um, from Morocco into France or Spain, um, exports going out, tourists coming in, um, all while the shadows of these prisoners are being oppressed here. And this is what Abraham Serfati represented while Simon Levy was operating as an elected official. Okay, so in the middle, of, uh, so these figures who were marginalized for so much of their lives, both of them, both Simon Levy and Abraham Serfati, I've spent a lot of time talking about the differences among them, both of them would emerge as, um, as sort of the heroes 
of the Moroccan state and be upheld as symbols of tolerance of the Moroccan state by the late 1990s. In the middle of the 1940s, the Moroccan Jewish population reached its peak at approximately 250,000 of that number, a small but disproportionate percentage were members of the Moroccan Communist Party. In the mid to late 1940s also represented the height of the Moroccan Communist Party's popularity in Morocco, although reliable numbers are harder to establish. Across the sources, the number of party members likely rests somewhere between 500 and the low thousands, although the figures for event attendance were often many times more than the basic membership count. Most Moroccan Jews were not very politically active throughout the 20th century. Most Moroccan Muslims were part of political parties other than the Moroccan Communist Party, including particularly in the 1960s and 1970s, organizations that were even more radical than the Moroccan Communist Party. Moroccan Jewish communists fought for an idealized Morocco that never quite came to fruition, but it's important to study through them and studying these minority populations sheds light on all parties involved. And Moroccan communist Jews like Simon Levy, like Serfati, like Edmond Amran al and others, have become some of the nation's most prominent um, Jewish figures, even after their death, intensifying, I would say, after their death. The book itself is divided into two halves, the interwar period until the end of the Second World War in 1945 until the late 1990s and the ascension of King Mohammed VI. The first half treats the period of French and to a lesser degree Spanish colonial rule in Morocco and political positions of Jews within Moroccan colonial society. And during this half of the book, France laid claim to the loyalty of Jews and many Jews within the colonial administration embraced France as their primary protector rather than the Sultan. Indeed, France had partially justified its rule in Morocco and elsewhere in the region as a purported protector of minorities out of an Orientalist understanding of Muslim quote unquote despotism. Organizations such as the Alliance Israelite Universelle worked as handmaidens to this process of Jewish Muslim deracination and challenges to pre colonial political and social alliances. During the Second World War, the anti-Semitic policies of the Vichy period undermined the idea of France as a protector, pushing Jews to begin to reconsider their political and social alliances, including the Sultan. It is within this period that the political, that the pre-colonial paradigm that Daniel Schrader wrote about, that of the Sultan's Jews, began to gain new strength, transforming into a modern Jewish mode of participation in Morocco's movement for independence. The second half of the book treats the immediate post-war period through the end of the 1990s. This half century includes the Jewish mass exodus from Morocco and the majority Jewish anxiety regarding the ability of the Sultan, king after independence, to protect, quote unquote, the community and the rise of the Sultan's communists in the movement for independence as well as the decades after. As the vast majority of Moroccan Jews left the country, the Sultan's communists entrenched themselves in loyalty to their homeland, in part by condemning those who left as traitors. Despite persecution by King Hassan II, the Sultan's communists continued to embrace a romanticized vision of a harmonious Moroccan Jewish past, despite their marginal status as Jews and as communists. This half of the book charts the transformation of this group from pariahs to heroes as they became international and national representatives of Moroccan exceptionalism in the Middle East and North Africa. By the time that King Hassan II died in 1999 and his son King Mohammed VI ascended the throne, the most prominent remaining Jews in the service of the centralized state apparatus known as the Mahzen in Arabic were those communist Jews. These figures included the dissidents who were welcomed home from exile, freed from prison, and rewarded for their patriotism, 
becoming the Sultan's Jews and thereby the emblems of purported Moroccan tolerance of its Jewish minority and of political opposition after decades of repression. The elevation of these Moroccan Jewish dissidents allowed the Mahzen to atone for an authoritarian political past while simultaneously highlighting Morocco's exceptionalism in the Middle East and North Africa for its commitment to the Moroccan Jewish past and present. And here you see two examples of the popular magazine, history magazine called Zman, which just means time in Arabic. You know, multiple different issues have addressed Moroccan Jewish subjects. So there, it's rare to see a, new, a week go by where in some Moroccan newspaper or journal outlet or another doesn't address some Jewish topic. So to conclude, characters like Simon Levy, Abraham Serfati, Edmond Amran and Male, and others illustrate that while Moroccan Jewish communists might have been small in number, their voices speak loudly from the margins. Their voices illuminate the long durée or the long history of Moroccan Jewish relations, state building, and the tensions of Moroccan Jewishness across the 20th century. Through the challenges of colonialism and the question of Moroccan Jewish political belonging, the figures in the Sultan's communists are simultaneously exceptional and emblematic, disrupting and nuancing modern Jewish history and modern Middle Eastern and North African history, charting the transformation of a pre-modern paradigm of power relations into the present. Theirs is a seemingly paradoxical tale of communist Jewish nationalists in a Muslim monarchy, of continued Jewish life in the Middle East and North Africa after the establishment of Israel and of Moroccan independence. Such stories are needed more than ever to remember the contingent nature of history, the fickleness of affinities, and that the world of today rests on a prismatic array of past political possibilities. Thank you very much for your time and for your attention and I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating and I think that uh, the audience as well uh, will agree with me that it was just really a very interesting program. Um, I open the floor to questions and I, I give both Haya and Jacob uh, first rights to ask questions and then we will open it to the floor. I would like a to ask about, um, well, first I, I just wanna comment that I've been to Morocco four times with groups. And I met and I went to the museum in Casablanca, the Jewish museum, and, and we toured with David El Malé, actually, uh, in the Jewish sites. So my question is, what is the status of the, how, how are, what's the status of the Jews now in, in Morocco, especially now that, that there are direct flights to and from Israel? Uh, so from when that happened, I saw that uh, the local community is very excited uh, to welcome so many Israelis with, with Moroccan roots uh, to come. So I, that my question to you is, is how to actually, how do we look at it now? What's their, where is their affiliation? Um, well, yeah, a lot of Moroccan Jews are very excited to see um, growing availability to see their relatives in most in many of these cases. I mean, th this has been going on for a long period of time that Israelis of Moroccan descent have been going to and from Morocco. Um, I really recommend the book um, Return to Casablanca by the anthropologist Andre Levy, actually, because he writes as an Israeli anthropologist of Moroccan descent who um, both does independent research and he goes on a few different organized trips and he has a very unique lens on what that process is like of returning both as a professionally trained anthropologist and as part of a tour group um, to the purported homeland for what that is like. 
um, I haven't been to Morocco in a few different years now. So I certainly haven't been there since um, during COVID, although I hope to be back relatively soon. Um, but my understanding is that among Jews, there is quite a lot of excitement about this normalization of relations. And Moroccan Jews, it, it's all tied to Western Sahara, just like these flights are tied to the normalization of um, being, you know, an exchange for recognition of Western Sahara and Morocco's ownership of Western Sahara as disputed territory, they would normalize relations with Israel. Um, and Jews, uh, you know, Simon Levy was so proud of being one of the first Jews in Western Sahara, one of the first of those marchers. He wasn't alone. The vast majority of Jews across Morocco were very excited about um, this opportunity to demonstrate their patriotism. And it was a very, very popular cause among Moroccan Jews in Morocco and in Israel. And so in 1975, you see this moment of real um, coming together over the question of Western Sahara among Morocco's com Jewish communities, both at home and in the diaspora. Um, and that speaks to the, the status of things today as well, right? This is a sort of continuation of that moment in 1975 around the question of Western Sahara. But at the same time, we see massive um, protest against normalization with Israel among um, the non-Jewish population, the majority non-Jewish population in Morocco and continued protests about that and continued protests about um, treatment of political opposition figures. So these things are, um, it's, it's sort of like the continuation of the Sultan's communists in a way where the Jews are by and large on the side of the state. And we see a popular protest against the state's policies that is seen to be in line with Jewish interests. Thank you. Dr. Lebenz, do you have any questions? I do, but I'd like to defer to our audience uh, and, uh, and our guests first. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. So I don't Very mind well. reading, or would you like to read them? Well, I've got them up. So um, we have one question. In post-World War II times, how involved were the Soviets in the Moroccan Communist Party development and actions? Mm. So yeah, one of my favorite um, archival sources to read is actually the American diplomatic archives in Morocco from that time, because they have the snarkiest things to say about Soviet operations <laughs> in Morocco during this time period. And I'll never forget, I didn't end up including this in the book because I couldn't find a way, it was just funny, but I couldn't find a way of integrating it elegantly in a chapter where um, there was some free Russian school that was operating in the capital city of Rabat. And um, the American diplomat says, you know, the Russians had the audacity to serve warm Coca-Cola at their reception, you know, like how dare they? I just find it funny they were serving Coca-Cola at all. Uh, <laughs> um, but that, that's just a sort of cute anecdote. But the Soviet Union was not terribly involved in the, the daily activities of the Moroccan Communist Party. Um, it started out as a branch of the French Communist Party. And really a lot of its activities continued, its international activities or collaborations with other communist parties continued to go through the French Communist Party. And that's actually the way in which I was able to access so much of this archival material because it's not really available in Morocco. Um, I can't really access all these things about the Moroccan Communist Party in Morocco. Where I can access them is surveillance reports in France and also the archives of the French Communist Party where the Moroccan Communist Party would send um, a lot of their political material and uh, there would be writing back and forth. And that's really where I could, that's where those really amazing propaganda posters came from. It's from the archives of the French Communist Party that had copies of these materials having to do with the Moroccan Communist Party. Um, so the Soviet, I mean, there were some cases where, you know, Simon Levy, for one instance, he, um, there was a massive, riot in Casablanca in 1965. Simon Levy was a part of it. It was a student. It started out as a student demonstration against, um, against the regime and it 
blossomed into this much bigger set of political grievances. Simon Levy was kidnapped off the street and tortured for eight days before being dumped unceremoniously at his doorstep early in the morning. The Soviet Union then to pay it, to repay him for his work on the part of the Moroccan Communist Party then paid for him to have a vacation in Hungary uh, with his family and his wife, Encarnacion Levy, we talked about how much she hated the food in Hungary, <laughs> notably, and they spent some time uh, next to some beautiful lake or something like that on the dime of the Soviet Union. So there were some of these connections. The Secretary General Aliyata, his sisters studied in Moscow. So there were some of these connections, but it wasn't like uh, what many people might be used to thinking about um, with Soviet high intensity involvement in the party's activities. Thank you. We have another question. What remains of Moroccan communist Jewry or Moroccan communism in general? Mm. Yeah, Moroccan communism, the, the main inheritor political party, the party of socialism and progress, that party still exists today. Um, and it still has seats in parliament. Um, and they were very helpful in some of this research. That photo I have of Leon René Sultan came from their archives that they were very generous in allowing me to republish. Um, so it still exists, but it's in this kind of defanged, non-threatening state um, that it's been in since the late 1960s, which is why Abraham Serfati left that party. It's, it's been in operation under that name since the late 1960s, early 1970s. And Abraham Serfati did not like that it seemed to be um, capitulating to the regime in these ways. And so it exists, it's just not nearly so radical as it once was and is just kind of a generic socialist human rights based um, political party. Um, that I have to say that it, it doesn't, it's the, for a long time the unions had um, much more teeth than the polit this political party had, for example. So communism itself isn't really active in Morocco. That party that is the inheritor of the Moroccan Communist Party is. Um, Jewish members, I mean, Simon Levy died in 2011. Uh, many of these figures died around the same time in the early aughts. Um, Sion Asidon, who was never a member of the Moroccan Communist Party, but it's sort of inherited or later organizations is still around and he works for human rights initiatives within Morocco. Um, but in general, it's, it's passed as a legacy and you don't see Moroccan Jews today discussing it much um, because these figures that I write about were political liabilities to, they were seen as political liabilities to the stability of the Moroccan Jewish community. When I first started doing this research, um, Jews I was talking with in Rabat and in Casablanca would say, well, why are you studying them? <laughs> like, who cares about them? Why don't you study our cemeteries some more? Um, like the safe topics, they were used to scholars studying those sorts of topics um, because then there's a this is why it's a minority of a minority. Most Jews were not part of this political wave, and they were very afraid that the actions of people like Serfati and Levy would blow back on them and make them seem like they were rocking the political boat more than they wanted to. So there's always a, a fraught relationship between the majority Jewish community and these figures that I write about as well. Thanks. So we've got a few more questions here. I'll start with this one. Uh, why did the many Moroccan Jewish anti-colonialist activi activists remain committed to Moroccan nationalism even after their persecution by the government? And how anti-Zionist were these Moroccan Jewish activists? They were deeply anti-Zionist. I'll start with that part. Um, they saw Zionism, this is after the Second World War. Before the Second World War, some of these Moroccan Jewish communists were also 
pro-Zionist um, and also pro-French. And it was a kind of political fluidity that stopped becoming available after the Second World War because of the catalyzing policies of the Vichy period that I mentioned. That fluidity just wasn't possible any longer. Um, but they were deeply anti-Zionist. Um, they constantly called on Moroccan Jews to disavow Zionism more loudly, more publicly, when Moroccan Jews were not willing to do that in that sort of loud way. Again, most Moroccan Jews wanted to remain apolitical and wanted to kind of stay out of the political limelight for the sake of communal stability. Whereas the Moroccan communist Jews were really trying to force the issue um, and, and condemned the wider Moroccan Jewish public for being too quiet on these issues, which didn't make them any friends, honestly. <laughs> they would um, write these pamphlets and issue these circulars and slip them under synagogue doors, which I'm sure most Moroccan Jews found highly irritating. Um, but in sort of calling them out on their political apathy. And that's why Simon Levy was so happy with the Green March that this was a moment where he actually agreed with the Moroccan Jewish majority community, which was a very, very rare occurrence. Um, but they were deeply anti Zionist. And, you know, Edmond Amran al Male, after his career in um, the Moroccan Communist Party, was a very prolific novelist. Unfortunately, none of his novels have been translated into English. Um, one of these days, I would love to work on a translation project of some of his materials, but a lot of his novels really circle around this question of um, anti-Zionism among the Moroccan Jewish left. And he has one novel in particular that starts with the massacre at Sabra and Shatila in 1982. And he connects that massacre to the mass exodus of Moroccan Jews. And I won't spoil too much of the novel, but in the end, the protagonist goes to Israel and he sees himself in this destroyed, the eyes of this destroyed little boy from Sabra and Shatila um, in the camps and sees this ultimate deracination of Moroccan Jews in this very creative and um, compelling way. So the point is, it's very, very strident. Um, what was the first part of that question again? Um, why did the many Moroccan Jewish anti-colonialist activities remain committed to Moroccan nationalism? Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, they were deeply, yeah, it's, it's really, they were kind of delusional. It's a fair question to ask. Um, they, they were really ideologically committed to, um, that's why I keep saying a Morocco that never quite came to fruition. They were committed to the ideal of a Morocco that could be, not the Morocco that actually surrounded them. The Morocco that actually surrounded them was a deeply politically repressive place. Um, and most of the Jews were leaving and most of their ideals were fading before their eyes. Um, so why they did it was out of this very, very um, strong political orthodoxy and um, stridency of idealism in their own beliefs. Thank you. So another question, um, what was the prompting cause of anti-Semitic restrictions during the World War II period? Hmm. Well, so the Vichy government is what instituted them. So in 1940, the, so France was, France and Spain had these two protectorates over Morocco starting in 1912. The Moroccan, the Spanish part was much smaller in the north, um, the most, the sort of main land mass of Morocco was under French colonial protectorate control. When France fell to Nazi Germany in the summer of 1940, the France itself was split into two zones, the occupied zone, the, the directly German occupied zone in the north, and the southern um, quote unquote unoccupied zone with its government center in Vichy, in the town of Vichy, which is you might know it for spa water as well. It was where well-to-do would go and take the waters to cure their various ailments in the late 19th century before it became the site of a Nazi collaborationist French government. Um, Vichy sunscreen, you might have seen that around. Um, it comes from the same spa waters of this town. Um, so the Vichy government still controlled of these North African territories and still controlled this massive French empire 
And as the Nazis instituted anti-Semitic legislation in the directly occupied zone, Vichy was also, um, they very enthusiastically actually, they often exceeded German demands for instituting anti-Semitic legislation. Um, and that anti-Semitic legislation applied not only to France, but to the French colonial territories. Um, so why that is the case has to do with a history of anti-Semitism in France. Um, and that what really is interesting and devastating in North Africa is as traditional French anti-Semitism intersected with really toxic colonial politics. Um, and for example, in Algeria, most um, Algerian Jews had received French citizenship through something called the Crémieux Decree in 1870. Um, in, in October 1940, their, their citizenship was stripped from them um, by the Vichy government. Uh, Moroccan Jews and Tunisian Jews had not been granted French citizenship in the same way, but they had different um, restrictions like those sorts of employment restrictions, like quotas in schools. Abraham Serfati's own sister was kicked out of school um, by a Vichy quota. Abraham himself was able to stay in school. Um, but the, the why of it is connected to, um, to French anti-Semitism. Um, and I recommend um, this, this book by Maris and Paxton. I think it's just called Vichy France. If you look up Vichy France, Maris and Paxton, you'll find the book and that will give you a good case of what's going on in the hexagon of France. Um, I also highly recommend an edited volume by Omar Boom and Sarah Abravaya Stein, um, The Holocaust and North Africa, that has a number of different chapters that explore those legal ramifications. And Daniel Schrader, who wrote about the Sultan's Jews, also wrote a lot about, has written a lot about those um, legal um, definitions in North Africa and what they were about. And um, I highly um, endorse looking at that volume as well. Thank you. That's interesting. I think we know something about Omar Boom, Boom yep. don't we? Hi, he came and spoke once. He came to Kent State. Yes. Yes. Oh, so, great. Yeah. Yes. It, fascinating as well. Um, yeah. So I have a comment and a question for you. Thank you for a wonderful lecture. Everyone agrees, I know. I would think that some of the Spaniards who arrived in Casablanca in the 1920s and 30s must have been socialists of the anarchist type rather than the communist type, at least those from Catalonia. Were there any anarchist influences in the Jewish communities of Morocco at this time? Hmm. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And that's a unique factor in Morocco versus other parts of North Africa is there were relatively more Spaniards um, that arrived in Morocco relative to Algeria and Tunisia. And there was a relatively higher influence of Spanish leftist engagement um, in Morocco than elsewhere. There were some Spanish anarchists that arrived. Um, but one of the interesting things that I've noticed in Morocco is whereas the politics among anarchists, socialists, communists, um, you know, leading eventually to the popular front kind of governments just to stave off fascism in the 1930s, while those sorts of um, tensions were much higher in places like Spain and in France, they were more muted in Morocco, um, possibly because there were just fewer of them. The stakes seemed to be a little bit lower, but I don't see within those internal documents much of a struggle um, among these different groups. And I don't see that much of a, a strong presence of anarchism um, itself as well. Thank you. And so someone asks, what advice would you give to someone interested in being a scholar of culture and history? So you've made a, a, a great impression on someone in our <laughs> audience. Oh man. Um, find out what you're most interested in first, because there, there are a lot of different ways of studying culture and history. Um, so depending on what languages you know, or you want to study, what area of the world you're interested in and want to study, what kinds of questions 
you like asking, um, what kinds of things you like reading. Um, I would say, depending on how much time you have, try to read as widely as possible in all of these different domains. Um, but I don't know, it depends on where you are in your, in your, in your um, career. Um, so I don't know, you're, feel free to email me <laughs> and we can talk more specifically. That sounds wonderful. Dr. Lebenz? Yeah, I, I, I guess I'll ask my question now. And thank you uh, again, uh, Dr. Hackman, for a fantastic talk and discussion. Um, I have a colleague, we have a colleague, uh, I went to grad school with Sarah Jay, who wrote a really fascinating dissertation on what ends up being sort of a triangular cultural, geographically triangular cultural uh, uh, um, connections or network between Jews in Algeria, at least until the mid 1960s, in France and in Israel. And this sort of tripartite uh, uh, sort of relationship built on memory, but also on movement and real connections, and for a time, also business links. Um, and you mentioned that, uh, of course, the legal position of Jews in Morocco uh, was different uh, leading up into World War II than it was in France, uh, excuse me, Algeria. But I'm wondering if there is a parallel there as well. Is there this? tripartite existence? Yeah, I would say it's just, it's much stronger in Morocco than it is even in Algeria, because in Algeria, I mean, relatively few Algerian Jews went to Israel um, compared with France uh, because of legacies like the Crémio decree. Um, so very, so many, many more Algerian Jews went to France. So that changes the direction of triangulation. Mm -hmm. um, and also Algeria has, um, historically been much less open to political negotiations with Israel and with the United States and those things come together often. Um, and Morocco defined itself very much as opposed to Algeria in its political trajectories during the Cold War specifically. Um, that Morocco was much more willing to have open negotiations with the United States. Um, the United States gave Morocco a huge amount of military um, investment, for example, for the Green March um, and for its other kinds of conflicts um, against Algeria, for that matter, because Algeria was seen as the sort of wild card in the region, the true, the revolutionary wild card, whereas Morocco was counted on to be a more stable partner. And Morocco began having um, kind of quiet meetings with Israeli representatives at really as early as the late 60s, honestly. Um, but they became more prominent in the 1980s, late 70s and 1980s. And so these, this policy that we have now um, with the formal recognition of Western Sahara and the normalization of relations has really been going on for many, many decades. This is just sort of bringing it all out into the open um, in a way that it wasn't before. And so there have been long time trajectory of circulation of um, Israelis of Moroccan descent going to, is to going to Morocco, circulating back and around, um, going to France as well. I mean, once I was in Jerusalem, just like doing some research and I ran into a Moroccan Jew I knew from Casablanca. <laughs> and I was just like, what are you doing here too? Um, we just ran into each other on the street. <laughs> and so, um, so that circulation, um, I would say, is, is more intense uh, in Morocco than it is in Algeria and has a longer endurance than it does in Algeria. Thank you. I have, I have another quick question about uh, the freedoms of the Jewish community cur currently in Morocco, specifically in Casablanca. I know there is the Alliance School, Jewish Day School. There are several kosher um, bakeries. There is a club, a, a country club that serves kosher food and there's all these synagogues. So is that, is that a true uh, freedom that they experience now is that, or or is that is there another um, layer yeah. of of insecurity? Um, no, I mean those things are all very true, and um, you know Jewish heritage is enshrined in the Moroccan Constitution. Mm -hmm. 
of 2011. Um, so there very much are these protected, um, openly recognized components by the Moroccan state of Jewish heritage. I would say that where there is insecurity in those same Jewish schools, the last time I went to that Aliyah school in Casablanca, it also had a large number of um, those roadblocks meant to keep car bombs mm -hmm. from going in, same as the United States Embassy in Casablanca. Um, so while these things are protected on paper, and while all of these things exist, um, there still is popular antagonism toward Israel that often finds expression against Moroccan Jews writ large. And that's an old phenomenon that has been that I talk about in the book that has been happening since um, the 1930s, really, and accelerating throughout the 20th century. So that's the layer of insecurity. And that's in those are the protests that we see now, right? Protests against normalization of ties with Israel. This popular sentiment is very much um, pro Palestinian and sees um, these new normalizations as a betrayal of Morocco's place as an Arab nation and its legacy as an Arab League member. Um, so those are sort of the, the primary tensions now. I'm oh, sorry, my cat walked in. You might hear her meow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's also, there is, isn't there now um, an effort to teach Jewish history yeah. in, in Morocco? Yes, yes. So there have been, I mean, for a long time, some of the most prominent scholars of Moroccan Jewish history are, are Moroccans themselves. Mohammed Kenbib um, wrote this amazing tome in the mid 1990s. That's kind of like the, the Bible of starting out in Moroccan Jewish history. Um, it goes from 1856 to 1948. Lamentably, he cut off at 1948. Um, and um, so Mohammed Kenbib has written that book. He's contributed lots of other shorter articles and written other books. Um, Jama Baida also teaches at Mohammed V University and um, he is now the director of the Royal National Archives. So all of the Royal National Archives in the country are through a scholar of Moroccan Jewish media history, actually. Um, there, are, there are even um, Islamic studies institutes that um, sponsor studying of Hebrew um, and studying of Jewish religious texts, right, for toward a well-rounded religious education. Um, there is this group called the Mimuna Club out of al oh, right, University. Yeah. yeah um, and they, um, you know, they're sponsored very prominently by Andre Azulai, who is this Jewish minister um, who has been um, a minister both to King Hassan II and to the current King Mohammed VI. Uh, there's the Moroccan Jewish Heritage Museum in Casablanca. Andre Azulai has also been instrumental in establishing one in Essaouira, where he's from, mm -hmm. this really beautiful coastal city. Um, so there's quite a lot of, um, and there are a lot of students. Yeah, so it's, you know, Jewish history is part of the curriculum for high school students as well. It's in the textbooks. Um, so all of these things. So Morocco is really quite unique um, in the region for that reason. Um, so, and it's, but at the same time, it's interesting, while there is a growing interest in the state and growing pedagogy across the state related to all things Jewish and Jewish tourism, you know, would be at an all time high if it weren't for COVID, um, then um, at the same time, fewer and fewer young people can actually meet Moroccan Jews in Morocco. Um, because the numbers of Moroccan Jews themselves are dwindling. It's an aging population and the Moroccan Jewish youth tend to go to France or to Israel for educational opportunities or employment opportunities. They come back for holidays sometimes or for um, pilgrimages to saint shrines or that sort of thing. Um, so there is returning, but they're increasingly becoming tourists in Morocco in the younger generations. In fact, that's what they said is, is what the parents expect of the young people to go to, or in, in even Montreal, to a country where they can speak French, where they can study yeah. in French and not stay in Morocco. Yeah. 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 
So in spite of that, I would plan to go to Morocco with the students from Kent State when the going is going. <laughs> so yeah, thank you so much, Alma. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you for the great questions. Thank you. And if there are no other questions and or no other comments, I think that we will um, we will close the evening out by saying thank you so much for a fascinating conversation. Um, I'm already dreaming of this trip to Morocco uh, with Haya, and I encourage everyone else to um, you know to consider this trip as well as soon as it is uh, it's viable. We will uh, will certainly think of your your comments and your and your lecture here. Um, and look forward to and look forward to that. And uh, and we look forward to seeing you at Kent State virtually or in person again. I, hope uh, so. I think but <laughs> again, I speak for um, both myself as well as the um, the other sponsors and those people who joined us um, in the audience by saying thank you so much. It was absolutely fascinating and wonderful. And with that, I will say um, good night. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Good night.